What a week it's been for the Phillies. This is the Phillies Talk Podcast presented by Team Toyota. Jim Salisbury and Corey Simon here with you as always. And the Phillies have swept the Nationals for the second straight time. Uh, they've now won eight in a row over the Nationals, a stripped down Washington team after the trade deadline. And the Phillies continue to pick up ground in both races, both the National League East and the second wild at, for the second wild card spot in that race as well. Uh, the Braves just dropped three in a row in LA, and the Phillies now end their portion of the day Thursday, just a game and a half back in the NL East gym. It's the closest they've been to first place since prior to that series in Arizona. They just look like a totally different team over the list this last week, especially at the plate. Yes. And a month ago they were in first place. So they've really had uh, quite the roller coaster here. Um, started August eight straight wins moved into first place. Then they lost 11 out of 15. Then they finished with five straight open September, make it six straight. Uh, Game and a half with a chance to go to a game uh, going into the weekend series, first weekend series of September. So they've been really up and down, but lately really up. Uh, the offense, very encouraging. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon is a uh, character player, always has been. Uh, and he was on Thursday. They were down 6 nothing. He, you know, big uh, three-run um, double and then um, another big hit to uh, get him going there in the eighth inning. Uh, so Thursday, down 6 nothing, capped that win to sweep the um, Washington Nationals. Uh, you know, they got to be feeling really good about themselves. They should be feeling good about themselves. They, they played really well. Um, you know, there was a dark cloud to uh, Thursday's game in Washington. Aaron Nola did not pitch well. And I know how badly he wanted to pitch well, how badly he needed to pitch well. His September struggles continue he'll probably have five more starts here in the month of September he's crucial they're already down uh Zach Eflin I still don't think they can overtake the Braves if uh if they don't get really good pitching from their top four guys because they're already gonna have to kind of navigate that fifth spot so he's he's got to get it going but um they did a heck of a job with the bats overcoming uh the hole that Nola dug them six nothing deficit I mean they got help the Nationals defense was terrible um, Nationals bullpen is bad, uh, but all season long, the Phillies have been um, playing poor defense and suffering for it today. Uh, Thursday, they, they benefited from somebody else's poor defense. So it's seven straight games. The Phillies have scored at least seven runs. And some of that's because the, you look at the last two teams, they've played the Nationals and the Diamondbacks. Those are two teams that are just waiting for the time, season to run out. I mean, they have a, a lack of talent on both rosters, particularly in the bullpens. The Phillies scored 12 runs in 12 and two thirds innings in this series against the Nationals' bullpen. And really, when they were down 6 nothing in the sixth inning of this game on Thursday, who even thought the Phils had a chance to come back? I mean, I know that they've done a good job of coming back this season, but when you're down 6 nothing on the final day of a you know road series and, and you're departing to Miami thereafter, it's like you would have, um, at that point, just figured, okay, this is going to be a Phillies loss and they'll end the day uh, pretty much the same way they started it behind the Braves. But they were able to rally back. And you mentioned Andrew McCutcheon, a guy who has not done a lot of hitting since he came back from that knee injury uh, a week or so into July. He was hitting below 200, but he's kind of turned it around here. And he's even more important as the Phillies are missing someone like Reese Hoskins, also missing Didi Gregorius for these three games in D.C. Yeah, you mentioned who thought they were going to come back and win that game down 6 nothing. I certainly did not think they were going to. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, I'll make a confession. I was deep into a story, um, you know, saying how, you know, it's just one loss, but uh, it's a troubling loss because Aaron Nola um, pitched poorly and, and his struggles in September continue. And um, that half of the equation is still true, but uh, they came back and they won that game. Uh, McCutcheon in his post game zoom, um, admitted he did think they could come back. And apparently the talk in the dugout was, well, you keep it at six, we're going to score seven because they have scored seven runs, uh, seven or coming into, coming in today, six, six games in a row. Now they're up to seven games in a row. And that's the first time they've done that since 1933, uh, which is crazy. But so McCutcheon, um, yeah, he, he said they thought they could come back. They were talking that way, keep it at six, we'll get seven. And, and uh, he was right. He was right. So um, heck of a job by the offense today. Um, McCutcheon clearing the bases that that eighth inning against that horrible bullpen. I mean, Marchand, what are they four and all with him behind the plate? He's done a great job. Um, real heady ball player, but he worked a big walk. Mayton puts the bat on the ball. 
Oduble puts the bat on the ball, beats out a double play. Their second baseman helps him out by not turning two double plays. So a lot of things went the Phillies' way today. But you know what? You take it. You capitalize it. Uh, you got six outs from Bradley. Uh, and um, but you got more than that. Coonrod and Bradley and um, uh, Ian Kennedy, nine big outs. Um, really good job by that bullpen today to, to win it. And uh, the Phillies have to be feeling good about themselves. They, you know, it, it, when you're in a race like this on, on the 2nd of September, and I know it's not a perfect race. They're not great teams. They have flaws, but it's still very entertaining for the fans. And it's very entertaining for the players. When you reach stages like this, I know from talking to players for 30 years, they can't wait to get to the ballpark the next day. I mean, you, you know, it's September. You're banged up. You're fatigued. It doesn't matter. You can't wait to get to the ballpark the next day because you are in a race. So I'm sure they can't wait to get to the ballpark in Miami on uh, Friday night. Uh, but another challenge for this team. Miami has always played the Phillies tough down there. They The Marlins completely scuttled the Phillies season last year, taking five of seven in that really odd seven-game series in September. Phillies have to, have to make sure it doesn't happen again this year. Uh, they got a good guy on the mound uh, Friday night, Kyle Gibson. So impressed by him, uh, his professionalism, the way he keeps his teams in games. Uh, he's made 24 starts this season between two teams, 18 of them quality starts. Phillies need another good one on, um, on Friday night. Well, the Phillies are not going to have to face Sandy Alcantara in that Marlins series. It took Miami forever to name a starting pitcher Thursday, but they named Alcantara their starter for their series finale against the Mets, which means that the Phillies are not going to see the best starting pitcher on Miami staff. The Phils are also four and one in their last five against the Marlins. So little sample size there, but potentially turning a corner. Um, you know, for much of the season, Jim, we've talked about the Phillies being unable to beat up on the bad teams in their schedule. That has not been the case with the Nationals in particular, these last two series. I mean, the Phillies have pounded them early in games. They've pounded the bullpen. Uh, they've let the Nationals make mistakes and implode in those games. They're 8-0 against the Nationals since July 29th, which was the day before the trade deadline. It's almost like the most important development for the Phillies this season was the path that Mike Rizzo and the Nationals decided to take at the end of that month. Yeah, the Phillies have capitalized. You have to capitalize on teams that raise the white flag. Look what the Tampa Bay Rays have done to the Baltimore Orioles, 18-1. That's basically the division right there. So, um, it, it, you know, you, you got to beat these teams, especially teams that are, that are white flagging, especially teams that have said goodbye to two of their top three talents, uh, Scherzer, Trey Turner. I mean, Soto remains, and he hurt you today. He certainly hurt Aaron Nola on Thursday uh, with four RBIs, a two-run home run. Nola hung a couple breaking balls. It was weird. I thought he was taking a step forward today. And then, uh, you know, save for a couple uh, hanging breaking balls, maybe he feels a lot better about this start. But I'm sure, he, you know, at least he, they came out of it with a victory, but you're right. The nationals are a very compliant opponent and the Phillies have done what you're supposed to do to teams like that. So they've, they've hit the Philly schedule uh, at a good time. They've popped up on the Philly schedule at, at a good time. So uh, we'll see what can happen with, you know, and to sweep the nationals on the road, I don't care who you sweep. The Phillies has been a poor road team this year. I think they were 10 under 5, 11 under 500 starting off this trip. So you get three wins on your belt on the road with six more on the road on this trip left uh, Miami and, and, and Milwaukee, that's a good thing. Yeah, and meanwhile, the Braves went to Dodger Stadium, lost all three games there. They lost Tuesday and Wednesday, dropping both games late. They led both of those games late, and the Dodgers were able to come back. Uh, the Braves finished their week with four games at Coors Field, which is always a difficult place to play, no matter how good or bad the Rockies are. Next week, it kind of flips, especially earlier in the week, because next week, the Braves have the Nationals and the Marlins, whereas the Phillies have the first three games of their week on the road against the Brewers, who have a very good pitching staff. So the same way that the Braves were tested early this week at Dodger Stadium is the way the Phillies are going to be tested in Milwaukee. But I mean, hey, there's a lot of baseball here to be played. 29 games left for the Phillies and a game and a half, two games back. That, that's nothing. Yeah, that's not hardly insurmountable. Um, but the Phillies, I don't think, can even think about the Braves. You have to think about the Phillies. You know, you have to play good defense. Defense has been a problem all season. You have to clean up the base running. Um, to me, Harper last, you know, on Sunday at home and then uh, Tuesday night in uh, Washington, very reckless on the bases. I know he's trying to put a team on his back and will it to victories, but, you know, there's got to be a fine line between overdoing it and you don't want to lose a game because of uh, bad rate base running. Just like you don't want to lose a game on two breaking balls, hanging breaking balls like it could have happened on Thursday, but the offense got Aaron Nola off the hook and the Nationals poor defense got Aaron Nola off the hook. But 
Um, Phillies just have to think about themselves, and, and, and that would be good enough. Uh, they, I think it's very important they have a good series in Miami because, as you mentioned, the um, – the um, Milwaukee Brewers can come at you with some serious pitching, uh, both, you know, out of the rotation where they're tremendous in the bullpen where they have some thunder. Yeah. And so the Phillies are expecting Didi Gregorius back for the Marlins series. Is that right? That's what Joe Girardi said on Thursday, but, you know, until it's wheels down and he, he has his uniform on, who knows? Well, the Phils uh, have been, you know, undermanned, missing some offensive guys. They thought that they had a chance to get Sir Anthony Dominguez back in the month of September, but when they made their initial September call-ups on Tuesday, he was not a part of them. The Phils brought up two relievers, Cam Bedrosian, a veteran who's pitched for the Angels, Athletics, and Reds, and Ramon Rosso, uh, as Sir Anthony Dominguez was activated from the 68A IL and option to AAA. Uh, do you think we could see him at any point in September, Jim? I think it's a possibility, but I don't know that's a certainty. Uh, he's struggled. Uh, you know, it's coming back from Tommy John in a calendar year is really tough. I mean, you know, the graft can be fine and holding up. The health can be fine. You can be feeling good. But it takes a while. I don't want to say you're pitching with a new arm, but you're pitching with new hardware. It takes a while to really, um, from my experience watching guys having Tommy John, it takes a while to really build that finish on the pitches, that little extra tick of velocity, and probably most importantly, that that command you know um that that turns a uh, a mediocre pitch or a pitch over the plate that could give you problems into a good pitch that's on the black um so he's he's going to need some time um the, the good part of the good news is he apparently is healthy uh he's popping it pretty good and if you know if hey if he has a couple good weeks i don't rule it out um but the important thing is he's pitching the triple a season's you know going through september this year um, the important thing is he's getting reps. Bohm's getting reps. Uh, but I don't necessarily rule out either one of those guys helping at some point if they get hot down there. I think this is uh, – the front office um, really has to kind of use those extra two pieces um, smartly here down the stretch. I think ride the hot hand. Uh, I think Joe likes having extra arms out in the bullpen, so there probably was an opportunity there for Sir Anthony if he, if he shined. But it's not – just given all he's been through, it's not surprising he's not quite ready. But I'm not necessarily alarmed because anything you got from him this year was gravy. I still, I'm still trying to build a guy that can help me next year. Well, another guy that the Phillies are trying to be careful with here is JT Real Muto, who's dealing with a shoulder injury, and then he missed some time with an ankle injury as well. He played first base in Thursday's series finale in D.C. Uh, do you expect to see him at first base more so than behind the plate here moving forward? Is this a case-by-day-by-day by day basis almost, or, or what? Well, Joe basically last week said, indicated strongly that JT is going to see probably more time at first base than catcher down the stretch, though he's still going to get behind the plate. He still is your catcher, but they're trying to keep him fresh. He's, he's got this shoulder thing that I think is probably a little more serious than they're letting on. I'm not saying it's a serious injury, but it's probably causing him more, um, I don't know, discomfort than, than everybody's letting on. Uh, but he got a couple of days off because of that rolled ankle. Maybe it was a good thing for his shoulder. Boy, on Thursday, he 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 led off that uh, four inning, uh, four run rally in the eighth with a really important double to right field. So he's a real difference maker in the lineup. Um, I would say the chances of him seeing more time at first base have increased even since we talked to Joe late, late last week, because or, or I should say earlier this week. Uh, but I would say the chances have improved. Because Marshawn's been so good back there. Uh, they're like, what are they, 4 0 with Marshawn? I think he's done a great job receiving, throwing, footwork's great, he blocks, um, and he's only getting better. So, you know, I, I think Joe's going to, I wouldn't be surprised if JT got behind the plate at least one game down in, um, down in Miami, uh, because you got to keep him doing that. Got to stay sharp back there, but first base is going to become a nice alternative. Um, you know, you might see, um, you know, Brad Miller in there against uh, a right-hander. And then you could um, put uh, JT behind the plate, uh, depending about, upon the matchups. Um, but, you know, you know we'll, we'll see. It's just good that they have JT back. And, you know, they got some options between uh, Marchand, JT, and um, JT and uh, Miller. You got options at first. You got options behind the plate. I think Joe will do some riding, riding of hot hands, but he certainly has to 
be pleased with what he's seeing of Marshawn. I, I think Marshawn right now qualifies as a hot hand. JT is JT and had a good game. So I think that pairing, Marshawn at catcher and um, and JT at first base could, could be something that Joe leans toward quite a bit here going forward. Isn't it interesting how Marshawn's been like a better offensive player in the majors than he has been in the minors? I know it's a very small sample size, but he's had some good moments. And then on Thursday, you know, he worked a very important walk late in that game during their rally, saw a lot of pitches, uh, took a couple close pitches to end that plate appearance. He did. That was a great, um, great at bat. Just tells you the, the little things in this game. I mean, Mayton and Oduble putting the ball in play. Those are really, really big things. Um, but, uh, little things matter so much in this game. Um, and, and he's, yeah, it is weird that he, but it, and as you point out, it's a very, very small sample size. And in this game, everything evens out. I, I The thing that surprises me probably more is that he hasn't hit better in, in the minor leagues. I, I haven't seen him a ton down there. I've seen him a lot in spring training and, and when he comes up here, but um, you know, he's a good defender. I think he's going to be above average defender. Uh, he needs to get stronger offensively. I think physically stronger will help him at the plate. But I do think he can be a guy who can hit, you know, 280 plus in the big leagues. And, and, and that's why I'm surprised he's only hitting the buck 90 in triple A. But, but Marchand's an important guy for next year because with JT getting banged up so much this year with like four nagging injuries, um, we'll see if there's a DH next year in the National League. Uh, you could maybe give him a little bit of time here and there at DH get him off his feet, give him a little bit of time at first base here and there. Reese, maybe some DH time if there's a DH, maybe a little first base time. Who knows where Bowman's is going to be. But I guess what I'm trying to say is you're going to have to find a way to preserve JT a little bit more after all these nagging injuries because you got him for four more years. Right. Um, if Marchand can be a very viable backup catcher, be a nice piece to have, especially if you can hit a little bit. Um, I would see that job is, is, is wide open next year. Maybe his for the taking, him and him and Nap. Um, maybe battling for it or maybe them just going with uh, Mar Marchan because he certainly brings something to the table. And I think that'll be a valuable position. I wouldn't say they're going to, obviously I'm not going to say they're going to split time there. I'm not even going to say that the backup catcher next year has to be a semi-regular, but it's got to be somebody who can really, you can, you can really count on to take some of JT's load away. Right. If you're going to, if you're going to protect JT uh, and get and optimize that the remainder of that contract was there trade interest in Raphael Marchand around the trade deadline this year? Oh, yeah, there was Pittsburgh for everything I heard loved him or loves him. Uh, they ended up getting another Phillies catcher, Abraham uh, Gutierrez. Uh, but a lot of teams like, um, like, um, Marchand, but I guess the Phillies like him a lot more. He's got a really big fan in the Phillies organization by the name of Joe Girardi. I think it was love at first sight <laughs> when Joe saw him his first spring training. Um, and you know, little things, right? Uh, catcher, catch, catcher's eyes. Joe fell in love with the way he blocked balls, um, which is you know uh, interesting because blocking is becoming kind of a lost art with the, all these guys um, going down on one knee and trying to trying to snatch everything. Uh, Marchand, you know, classic drop, smother, keep the ball in front of you, freeze the runner. He's very good at it. Um, so. He's got a bright future, but he's playing He's playing an important part here in the present as well. So, Jim, we know that Reese Hoskins is done for the season, but what about Zach Eflin? Is, it, is there a potential that we could see him again in September, or is he just totally done here? Well, I guess there's a potential that anything could happen, but Joe Girardi last weekend uh, was asked if he thought we'd see Eflin again this year, this season, and he admitted it was likely that we won't, or that he won't, that he won't have him the rest of the year for this reason. I'm, he was supposed to pitch a week ago. His knee flared up. He had to go back on the DL or the IL. Same day, he ends up on the COVID list. So he's going to be down because of that positive test for at least 10 days. Um, having not pitched in the big leagues and only gotten three innings in rehab since July 16th, it's really going to be tough to ramp him up. They're going to be, you're not going to ramp him up in, 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 a, in a week, right? I mean, it takes time to build back up and get into a major league game. Um, when he's been shut down with the knee, when he's been shut down with COVID. And there just might not be enough time to do that uh, and get him major league ready. So Joe acknowledged that it's a pretty good chance that Eflin's season is over. And um, that's where that stands. I guess based on that and based on the math, how much time it would take him to ramp up based on what he's overcome, based on uh, what he's facing and, and how much time he's been away, like I said, July 16th, 
I would put it as a, a very serious, serious long shot. And when Joe says um, there's a pretty good chance he won't be back, uh, that's a strong admission from Joe, who seldom, you know, admits to anything strongly. So, um, you know, it's Wheeler, Nola, uh, Wheeler, Nola, um, Kyle Gibson and Ranger Suarez the rest of the way. And you're going to have to kind of cross your fingers. You can get through with that number five spot, Matt Moore, or whoever else ends up there. Um, because it looks like Eflin's going to be down the rest of the way. Well, the Phillies have nine series left. The only team they have more than one series against left is the Miami Marlins, and that's where they go next. They have three in Miami, then three more in Miami to end the season. Uh, and the Phillies have made it six wins in a row here. The offense has been hot. They've been doing a lot of little things, which you have to do when you have so many key injuries like this Phillies ball club. So that's going to do it for this edition of the Phillies Talk Podcast. He's Jim. I'm Corey. Talk to you early next week. 